colleagues and students. It is my great pleasure as the Dean of our faculty to host this online conference and to welcome you all. I would especially like to thank to Professor Henry Senoff for accepting our invitation. And of course, I would also like to thank in particular to Professor Derya Oktay and her team for their efforts for this online conference. Um, I wish a very fruitful conference to all participants. And uh, this conference uh, will be moderated by Professor Derya Oktay. So the stage is yours, Professor Oktay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Zay uh, Hello and welcome to you all. Uh, Henry, dear Henry, I am very pleased and honored to have you here with us tonight, although not in person. Uh, Harry Sanoff, uh, Professor Emeritus of Architecture at North Carolina University, State University, is a highly respected figure in the architectural research milieu and luckily a friend. Tonight uh, or today in his time, uh, he will speak about democratic design, uh, his major interest in research field. But before he starts, I would like to add a few more things, although there are many things to, to say about him. Uh, Harry has four decades of research and professional practice worldwide uh, experience, and known for his many books, including Democratic Design, Participation in School Planning, Programming and Participation in Architecture Design, Participation in School Planning, Programming and Participation in Architectural Design, Community Participation Methods in Design and Planning, uh, Creating Environments for Young Children, Evaluation and Participation in Design, and Visual Research Methods in Design, and Methods of Architectural Programming. As these, as these titles reveal, uh Henry has always put people at first uh, in uh, put people first and prefers a human centered approach towards transforming the environment through various settings and he is recognized as the principal founder of Edra Environmental Design and Research Association through which in their meetings I got to know him better. Uh, and recip recipient of many important awards and taught and lectured in more than 80 institutions, again, worldwide. So uh, most of you may know him, and it's better to listen to him now. Uh, I'm really pleased uh, to see you here. And please, it's your turn, Professor Sanov. Thank you. Thank you. Um, OK. How do I get started? Ah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, the title is Democratic Architecture, a research-based approach. Um, first, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about my concept of research. Um, I'm going to introduce a few um, ideas which form the basis uh -oh. of this uh, lecture. Uh, so research is systematic work undertaken to increase knowledge and understanding of an issue. I describe that process as democratic design, where people affected by design decisions are involved in the process of making those decisions. Another way of stating it is the, 
the whole notion of the client. Um, as professionals, we realize that um, there's such a thing as a paying client, the people who pay for the work that we do. Now, I'd like to introduce the idea of a non-paying client, the people who actually use the environment uh, that we create. So that distinction is, is quite uh, an important one. And if you accept the idea that we have a responsibility to the um, non-paying client, then it becomes important to understand um, how do we do that effectively? Because it's very clear that the language that we have developed to communicate with each other is a technical language. And people who are not educated in design and planning don't understand this language. Um, just as a, a, an aside, uh, Democratic Design is a book was written about 10, 15 years ago. It's been translated into Polish and Russian, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the, the, uh, I think my mouse, okay. Um, one of the methods that I've developed to be able to communicate with people who are not designers, um, I call design games. Now, I was always fond of games like Monopoly. And I'm sure many of you um, have heard of that and have played it because it's in every, every conceivable language. Now, one of the things that's interesting about Monopoly, there's rules. Every game has a set of rules. Now, you can be an expert in winning at Monopoly, but that knowledge doesn't transfer to real life. And so the issue of transferability then becomes really a crucial one. So consequently, the concept of design games is created so that um, the experiences of playing the game, in effect, is a simulation of real life. And those people who um, uh, play the games and understand the concepts um, can communicate more effectively with design professionals. Now, games have rules. And the rules, uh, oh, I think, isn't this awesome over here? Yes. <laughs> um, game symbols. Uh, and that require individual choices and decisions. Now, the important thing is that um, everybody should have an opportunity to participate. So that I've always used small groups, no more than four or five people. And there are rules. Just that, um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the rules suggest that everybody makes individual decisions and then as a group has to agree by consensus. No voting, voting is not allowed in this process. Now, the reason for this, um, quite often we see um, uh, communities around the world talk about the importance of participation and the way it's actually um, uh, presented is a public hearing where lots of people get together and the difficulty is that the people that come to public hearings are either those that have something to gain or something to lose. Also, um, public hearings often tend to be dominated by political leaders, religious leaders, wealthy people, and quite often uh, people who have the experience uh, of, of the situation um, sometimes don't feel very comfortable in making comments in a large group. So here in small groups, everybody has the opportunity to participate. Um, if there's um, an aggressive individual public official within the group, um, that individual can only influence maybe three or four other people. And quite often, if there's a group discussion um, and people have to reach agreement, uh, quite often people learn things that they haven't learned before. And, and basically, the whole idea 
of um, people making individual decisions and then di discussing and debating them, it, it promotes the sociological concept called values clarification. We all have different beliefs, different values. And uh, the small groups allow people to express their beliefs and values and learn from each other. Um, so um, the box idea was really a very interesting one. And the first box was about 50 years ago. And it turned out that the boxes lose parts and they get, they're expensive. And so I put all the games into a book called Design Games, it was translated into Japanese um, 1994, and it's in its third printing now, uh, in Korean, and um, the last year into uh, Spanish. What I'd like to do is show you a few projects where the, the games are an integral part of the entire process. And I'll, I'll start with um, Bangalore, which is an Australian town. It's the most eastern part of Australia. And I was um, going to be teaching at the University of Sydney. And they asked if I'd come a week earlier to work with this small town in Bangalore because I had done a lot of work uh, around the world in small towns. Um, and the people in Bangalore, you know, were delighted for me to come. And well, the issue was that the government was planning uh, a highway to go from uh, Sydney up to the Gold Coast and all the way out to um, Bangalore, except that they were planning to bypass the town of Bangalore. And uh, I, I guess the people in the, in the small town felt that retail business would, would drop. So they wanted me to come see if I can help in some way. Um, they offered uh, to put together a team of local experts in Bangalore, um, historians and uh, planners. And I suggested that I will use the team as a resource, but I wanted to have um, four or five students from Sydney, School of Architecture, to come. Um, it was their you know, semester break. So five students took a train, must have been an eight or nine hour train ride from uh, Sydney to Bangalore, not knowing what they're going to do, not knowing who I am or what I've done. They were undergraduate students um, with an interest in just trying to see uh, what it's like to work on a real project. <coughs> so th this is the entrance to Bangalore. It's a, a typical small uh, Australian town. Um, not a very elegant entrance. Um, but this is the oldest uh, building in the town. And um, small Australian towns are notorious for their unusual graphics. Uh, so the first step, I met the students at night and we, we, we talked about the need to just walk around the town, drive around the countryside and talk to the people before we decide to do anything. Now, one of the most important strategies, I call it ABCD, asset-based community development. Now, typically, designers and planners tend to have a negative outlook on their work. You know, quite often they start with defining the problem. Well, this is really a wrong approach in a community because it's a negative approach and um, people tend to look at problems and not look at assets. And so my approach has always been to start with the positive aspects of the town. So there's a sense of pride in the town and in, in the discussions that we, we have with local people, some of the difficulties do surface. So the first thing um, I said, and this is you know actually not the most beautiful town that I've ever been to, but 
there, there were some really wonderful features. And so it was important for me uh, to indicate this. This town is kind of special, it's unique, and it's worth um, helping. Now, in all projects, it's absolutely crucial to involve um, people of all ages because you know, young people live in the town as well as old people. Now, um, involving young people has several benefits. One is that uh, some of you may be parents, uh, and you know when children come home from school, you always ask them, you know, well, what did you do in school today? And quite often, you know, certainly my kids said, oh, it was boring, nothing really happened. But when the kids are involved in talking about the future of the town and do drawings and models, they come home and say, we did something really exciting that we've never done before. And so the, the, the children then become um, a vehicle for communicating to their parents that something interesting and exciting is happening in the town. So children do drawings. And um, uh, quite often, the school administrators are interested and excited. And we get lots and lots of children involved in painting and making models. So the first step was to interview as many people in the town as possible. We set up interviews for about 45 minutes each, students, uh, local townspeople, those that couldn't come to an interview, um, we visited in their shops. And the idea was really to find out what was unique, what was special. And we, we didn't talk about the fact that there may be a bypass and uh, that would prevent uh, the tourism. That was really a concern primarily of the businessmen. But a lot of the people in the town were concerned that there's not much activity going on, nothing for young people to do. Young people tend to leave the town, which is typical of small towns around the world. So we had uh, a workshop and, and through the conversations that we had, with townspeople, we found out what things that were important for us to, to look at carefully. And we call the workshop Pride in Place. And again, um, trying to establish a very positive outlook uh, on this whole process. <coughs> so the workshop, this is a town, maybe 3,000 people. Uh, about 100 people came to the workshop. I think they were more interested in um, seeing what I would say because I coming from many thousands of miles away. Um, but it, it brought together old people, young people. Um, there were dairymen, cattlemen, uh, a wide range of, of different kinds of people from, from the region. Now, uh, one of the interesting things that we had to start with is really to talk about the, the goals of the town, what kinds of things are important to improve and develop. Um, and this is just a, a, a summary of a lot of the statements that were made. Recognize the assets of the natural resources, heighten political awareness to the town's unique historical character, provide youth oriented activities. And then for each goal, there were very specific strategies for how to accomplish the goal. And subsequently, an action plan was developed um, a timetable and who's responsible uh, for uh, uh, dealing with the strategies. Now, one thing that's very unique about workshops in Australia, you'll notice there are pictures of beer. Now, uh, in the United States, that couldn't happen very easily. Um, but Australia, it's really very, very effective because, you know, after people are drinking a bit of beer, they kind of become much more relaxed and um, uh, the conflict is, is minimized. So one of the key issues that, that surfaced was the entrance to the town. So um, what we did is have a picture of the entrance and the students would do um, just sketches and um, each group in the workshop would talk about what they liked about the existing and what they disliked, as well as the design idea. And the design idea was basically minimizing graphics and introducing uh, 
more um, plant materials. Now, this is actually a very powerful strategy because when a hundred people are talking about the entrance to the town, the town and the town entrance becomes a crucial issue. So during this workshop, one of the residents said, um, I'm going to donate 50 palm trees to the town of Bangalore. This is what it looks like now. Very dramatic difference. And it was really because <coughs> there was so much of a discussion about town entrance, um, people felt that it was important. Um, another feature that surfaced in the discussions was a, a vacant building that was at one point in an art gallery. And the idea, the same thing, what do you like and dislike about the existing? And um, the design idea just had some, you know, landscape materials and people. But again, the point was to focus on the art gallery as, uh, as an important asset to the community. That's what the art gallery looks like today. It's a very lively um, um, building with lots of interesting exhibits going on. <clears throat> now, the, some of these photographs are um, Google Map. I didn't have a chance to go back several times, but uh, it's Google Maps help considerably. Now, uh, typically in Australian towns, there's what they call veranda. It's kind of like a balcony. And uh, a number of years ago, all the verandas were eliminated. And consequently, a lot of the town really wanted to restore the verandas, bring them back to life. So this was um, taken about three months after the workshop. Um, they did put in one or two verandas. Now, what was happening here was very interesting. Um, this is an area where um, Paul Hogan lived. Paul Hogan, you may know, is Crocodile Dundee. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't at the workshop. I heard that he was doing another Crocodile movie at the time. But somehow money was flowing into this town. Um, and so this was done three months after. And now this is what the town looks like. So um, here in a period of four days, by just kind of pinpointing um, issues that could improve the, the character and the quality of the town, make it more livable, the townspeople were able to do the work themselves. They raised the money, hired landscape architects and, and the like. Now, uh, Japan has been uh, particularly interesting uh, because a group of Japanese people, about 10, 12 people, came to look at some of the work that I'd done in North Carolina uh, and, and really look at the process. And they were intrigued by the concept of games because games are really an integral part of the Japanese culture. So um, I, I was uh, teaching in Seoul, Korea at the time and made a side trip to Tokyo to do uh, a series of workshops. Uh, for about four years, I was doing workshops in the concept of games, how to organize them, um, just basically training. And for six years, I was going back at least three times a year uh, to do projects. Now, um, in Japan, there were two conferences design games conferences. About 400 people attended. Everybody either had to present a game at the conference or present a game that they developed in their community. So the concept of design games has really caught on in Japan. And right now, there's a second generation of people who are using design games um, in a variety of different kinds of community and design projects. Now, one thing that's particularly interesting, and, and um, I, I was kind of a bit concerned about, 
is um, in Asian culture, age is very important. Um, people feel very comfortable asking you how old you are because they kind of position themselves by age in terms of uh, other people. And um, in a group, if there are young people and old people, young people don't say a word until the older people come in. Now, with the, the strategy that I developed for games, everybody has to make an individual decision and then the groups have to agree by consensus. This has been a kind of a very dramatic change in the way people behave, certainly in terms of uh, developing uh, planning and community uh, based issues. Um, this is perhaps one of the more interesting projects. Uh, it's, um, you know, Japan doesn't have a lot of, lot of land. And this is a, a Nano is a town of a, a few hundred thousand people. And there's um, insufficient recreation area. The mayor and the um, um, planning department of uh, the city had proposed solutions for the recreation area. They proposed solutions for about two years and every solution they proposed was rejected. <clears throat> so it was decided to invite me to come there to see if there's something that I could do to help this, uh, this recreation area get implemented. <clears throat> now, in Japan, um, I have a policy can only spend three days on a project. Um, this is um, something that um, my wife established uh, guidelines for my work out of the country. Uh, no more than five days. Two days travel, three days work. So I developed a strategy for uh, doing projects in a short period of time, three days. <clears throat> so the issue was really um, filling in a portion of the river for recreation area. So again, the first thing I suggested was to um, get some boats and take some of the young people, middle school, high school students, around to get a sense of the perimeter and the scale of this recreation area. Well, of course, initially um, there was some reaction that, you know, you know what do children know? What do they know? They, they go to school to learn. And I suggested that um, this is the condition that I think is crucial. So um, boats were made available the first day I arrived. And um, there were parents, teachers, mostly students, uh, two or three boats, so that everybody has a sense of the size of the project. <clears throat> but not only that, the fact that they were initially contacted um, to be involved in the entire process. Now, um, what, what sometimes happens, there's a lot of uh, like paparazzi or people that want to come and observe. Uh, there were about 35 people, a few townspeople, but people came from all over Japan wanting to observe. And I really uh, had to put everybody to work because I, I didn't need observers. And so the, the first step identifying how we, what materials we develop and how we uh, kind of organize it to engage the community. So there, the basic strategy was to identify all the possible obje um, objectives for a recreation area, just brainstorm. And then uh, they were done in uh, Japanese and then I reviewed them in English to make sure that everything was covered. Um, and this was a group of people who didn't necessarily live in the town, but they were kind of from other parts of Japan. But th this is a brainstorming session, so it was only important to generate as many different objectives as possible. Um, the other step was to identify the whole range of possible activities that could occur in a recreation area. And uh, a symbol was created and um, a lot of people that came were drawing symbols. 
Now, um, there were maybe one or two architects and landscape architect, but most of the people were townspeople, but everybody felt comfortable in developing symbols. There were about 10 people generating um, a lot of these symbols. And the symbols you can see are roughly the size of a poster stamp. Um, and the, the symbols were, were prepared to be in scale with the actual site. And I'll show you how that works. Um, we established the perimeter of the recreation area, uh, developed a base map. And then I met with the young people just to explain the process that um, they'll be going through. And then we had a workshop Sunday morning. At, it was a shopping mall right next to the site of the, um, the recreation area, proposed recreation area. I think there were about 80 people that attended the workshop. And the idea was for them to initially identify um, the objectives for the recreation area in their town and the activities that correspond to those objectives. Now, one of the key concepts that we as planners, designers are familiar with is the concept of trade-offs. But if you try to define trade-off, it's really very complicated. But when um, the people in the groups begin to locate activities on the site, and these activities are in scale, they realize that everything doesn't fit. So they have to begin to make trade-offs. And so by direct experience, they're dealing with making trade-offs, deciding which is more important. Um, young people were working by themselves. The women's group, they did a three-dimensional model. And then each group presented their ideas. They weren't very dramatically different, but you know, and you, you'll notice in, in basically in all the projects that I do, they're always smiling faces. And this is really crucial because uh, no matter what kind of conflict exists, people enjoy the process because nobody ever asked them to be involved. And second, it feels like a game. And games imply fun. Um, in the afternoon, that morning session was about two hours. The afternoon, um, about 400 people came to the local um, auditorium. And I described the process that we went through and each team presented their ideas. Um, there was one, one team, there were young boys, about 11 or 12 year old. And as they described their um, solution, they pointed to one part of the site and said, this is an area shaded with trees where our fathers could sit and drink beer. Now the whole audience, you know, went bananas. Well, there wasn't one adult that would say we need a place where we can drink beer, but young people are totally uninhibited. And, and the mayor realized at this point how important it was to have young people um, be involved in the process. So um, uh, all, all of the um, proposals were examined and a summary was prepared. And the mayor and the planners came and looked at it and said, oh my God, this is what has been proposed for the past two years. And here in three days, you came up with the solution. And, and of course I said, the difference was this solution came from the community. It wasn't imposed by you know, local government. And, and this realization was really very important. And, and, and I've seen this time and time again um, throughout projects they've done all over the world. Uh, the fact that people are asked to do it doesn't necessarily mean that the results are going to be different, but they have ownership in the solution. Then um, usually when I do projects like this, I ask, there has to be a commitment. In one year, there has to be something um, built. 
and this was um, one year, basically an amphitheater uh, with some parking and trees. And more recently, uh, a picnic area. So this was done by you no know, local government in a three day period. Um, one of my favorite kinds of projects are schools. Because um, in the United States, as well as maybe other countries, there's something called school architects. And, and quite often they produce the same school time after time. Some countries, there's a standard plan that um, no matter what the site is like, no matter what the climate is like, it's the same building. But uh, in the United States, I have an opportunity to um, work with young people and teachers. In this uh, town, there were four schools being built at the same time. And there's one community called Davidson, which wanted uh, to be involved uh, with the architect. And I worked with a former student of mine for about 20 years. Uh, he has a practice and I work as an individual uh, consultant. So the first step was to um, get students to do drawings of, the, of their school, ideal school. The present school was a two-story building and it was beyond repair. And there was a new site available close by. Um, and so uh, it was within walking distance. So uh, the students were asked to really do drawings of the kinds of things that they liked. Um, and of course, in the, when the school was built, on the front page of the newspaper, Davidson School Design with Kids in Mind. And I'll show you uh, a little bit how that happened. Um, quite often, working with um, teachers and children and parents, um, the, the concept of a wish is sometimes more valuable than trying to state objectives. And so we start with what I describe as a wish poem, where the teachers complete the sentence, I wish my school. We did this with all the children, uh, teachers, and parents. Now, we, we can't satisfy all the wishes, but at least the teachers can think about what's important. Uh, a wish a school was warm, colorful, friendly. A wish, wish my school was beautiful, unique, and interesting, had lots of sunlight. Now, I, I've never heard a teacher say, I wish my school was ugly but we do see a lot of really poor schools. The parents wanted a school, I wish my school to be state and nationally recognized. Uh, it could be a community center in the summer and off hours, um, inviting front entry. And um, so the next step was really to engage the teachers in a process where they talked about educational objectives independent of the subject. It doesn't make any difference if it's um, language, science, art. There have to be education objectives, um, like uh, reinforcing self-expression, positive self-image, uh, resourcefulness. And we went through a similar process. Small groups of teachers coming together so they could be teachers having different subject areas but the objectives are really the most important thing then as they identify objectives they identify the range of teaching methods and this comes from the educational literature uh, lecture self-presentation group problem solving program instruction so there's a wide range of teaching methods most of which are not used at all and this is, again, uh, an important aspect of the process. And finally, there were about 30 photographs, small photographs, and the teachers had to match the teaching methods that they thought were important with a picture, a picture of the environment. Now, the pictures were selected 
so that there wasn't a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if they wanted some kind of meeting area, they'd have to look at the picture and say, well, this is too big, but we have to change that. So what this was doing was sensitizing teachers to the physical environment so that there's a connection between educational objectives, teaching methods, and the places where education occurs. Well, um, then we, we had a discussion about the school that they were already in, the two-story building, and the teachers unanimously complained that um, all the classrooms that faced, its, faced south were warm and comfortable. The classrooms facing north were cool and uncomfortable. And they said that we want all the classrooms to face south. Um, there were a few other things that they said, um, but that was perhaps one of the most important. So the, the final workshop was really to walk the site and then um, to do a basic site plan. Um, again, there were teams and there were, um, th there's a school of architecture in this area and there's some faculty involved as well. Um, there were uh, parents and teachers then each team had to produce a solution. And then everybody presented their ideas. And finally, they all said, we can't solve the problem. You're the architect, you solve the problem. Now, this is really essential because most people don't know what architects do. You know, uh, in, in many countries, it's by law that you have to hire an architect. But when people directly experience it, and they had very clear objectives, they wanted all the classrooms to face south. They couldn't do it. And they understood the value of an architect. And this really, this understanding really helps build trust between the community and the architect. So we went back to the office and uh, looked at the solutions. And uh, I did a sketch where all the classrooms would face south. And it was presented to the teachers and they made comments. Now, in, in many states in the United States, there's a, a, like a State Department of Public Instruction where any school building has to be reviewed by this group and they're they're basically architects and this review process uh, they make comments and when they when we submitted this for review there were several pages of comments saying that they didn't like anything that we did and they said first of all um, the schools that they build in north carolina have double loaded corridors which means that there's a, a hallway and classrooms on both sides. Well, if you did that, you wouldn't have all the classrooms facing south. There were, um, each one of the classrooms had an outdoor area. Uh, this is what, you know, the teachers and the parents said, you know, outdoor learning is as important as indoor learning. Well, what that meant is that there's a door to the classroom from the corridor plus a door to the outside. Well, they said, you know, the State Department of Public Instruction people said, well, um, this is a security problem. Uh, maybe the students will escape. I don't know. At any rate, they said they will, they will, um, if we choose not to make the corrections, they will make the uh, modifications and present it to the community. So they did. Um, they called for a meeting. Uh, about 125 people came and the people <clears throat> from the state you know said we did a good job but there were some problems and they um, uh, wanted to present uh, their solution to these problems at this point the woman who is the chairperson of the Peaches association stood up and said we worked with the architects um, on this proposal that they made 
and we have total support for that proposal. This is what we wanted, and we refused to look at anything else that was, you know, developed by the state. And the meeting is called to adjourn. So the state people didn't present anything. Everybody went home. <clears throat> so we finished the drawings, and we um, we sent them out to bid. And the, the budget came in, well, the, the, the prices came in $300,000 under the budget. Consequently, the state officials congratulated us for doing such a wonderful job. See, they were afraid because when they looked at the perimeter that this building was going to be too expensive. And there's, a, there's always a fixed price in the United States for public schools. And you don't have... Um, very much leeway uh, in, in uh, changing it. So one of the other interesting aspects of the project was that there were um, local artists in this town and the artists wanted a place where they could exhibit their work. And so there are three towers Oh, there is and the towers became exhibition areas. So the local painters and sculptors would exhibit their work. Now, the impact of this artwork has been phenomenal on the teachers and the students because the artists were, were actually working with teachers um, and the quality of art has been absolutely astounding. There were three galleries. Now, all the students that have been part of the school have their imprint in the building, working with the local artists. This is a tree and each hand has a student's name. Each rock has a student's name. Here's a town and each house has a student's name. Each flower has a student's name. Now, what has happened, this was done uh, 25, 30 years ago, 25 years ago. I, I met recently parents who had children that went to the school when it was built. Now they're married, they have children, and they took their children to the school, five and six year old school, and showed them where their fathers and mothers had their name imprinted as part of the building of the school. So this has truly become a community school. And, and the, the building looks better now than it, than it did when it was first built. This was the front page of the newspaper. Kids get user-friendly school. You don't often see architecture on the front page in a positive light. So this is what the school looked like when it was built towers and that's what it looks like today um, this school has a waiting list of teachers who want to come to teach here um, this is another school in, in minnesota uh, minnesota <clears throat> it, it snows a lot it's very cold. And this is a building that was originally a Bible college and it went bankrupt and the state bought it and converted it to um, an arts high school, a center for arts education. But they didn't change the exterior, they just did some interior renovations. And um, we were, let's see, the, when, let me go back to say we were invited to submit a proposal for a master plan at, at this point in Minnesota before any organization could get money for construction they had to have evidence that they needed in effect uh, they call it a pre-design requirement but it was really a program or a brief um, and the each community that was looking for money had to pay 
for the development of the program, which probably was in the order of $25,000 or $30,000. So we were competing with five Minnesota architects and uh, we were coming from the South and um, teachers asked, well, do we understand the climate of uh, Minnesota because we don't have this kind of snow? Well, this is a campus and there are five buildings and there's no connection between any of the buildings. And this was done, done designed by a Minnesota architect. And the, the students, when walking from one building to the next, their fingers freeze. So if they're playing a guitar or a violin or painting, they can't wrap their hands around the brush. And so I said, look, this was designed by a Minnesota architect who didn't understand the climate. So we got the project. And the first step was to um, talk to the students. And th that's where we found out some of the problems of, of uh, the students had going from one building to another. We, we had to basically develop a program, but what we did is inventory the amount of space that they have. And with each group that we met, we had to find out what their additional requirements were and what the additional space needs would be. Did that in about a day. Um, I met with uh, library staff, principals. And again, we used the symbols. Now, um, this is an arts education school, which means that there are drama students, uh, art students, dance students, no design students at all. So the, uh, the symbols that we use to um, um, look at each activity that would be going on into the building. And this is, these are all to scale. And we provide a site plan. Now, all of the students, uh, 250 students plus teachers and parents were involved in the process. And this was really essential because they were the experts. We were the experts in developing a process. They were the experts in having the knowledge and information about what ought to happen. And so, again, working in small groups, um, uh, teachers, parents, people from the school administration did the planning. And then um, there's a presentation and the, the drama students love this because they were really you know, presented a very dramatic uh, way of, of sharing their ideas. And so we had um, quite a number of different um, options and we tried to summarize um, all of them. Um, uh, this is the, the ugly building in the, that already exists. And a lot of people try, the yellow represents new functions. They wanted to wrap the uh, existing building with, with other stuff. So finally, we, we uh, the, the, the white is the existing building and the, all the yellow represents new functions. And the idea was to really make stronger connections. Now, one of the issues was that uh, model, that the state only gives, at that time, $6 million for any project. I hear the teachers and parents are smiling, loving the proposal because it only took four days. So the site plan was developed and color coded based on priorities. So blue, for example, and, and the priorities were based on $6 million increments. So the blue represents the highest priority for $6 million. Um, then we were invited to um, submit a proposal to actually do the building. Um, and this was a submission to the state architects. So we went back to Minnesota and again met with 250 students. This time we had some um, concrete proposals for the planning. 
Um, there were three alternatives. Now, the important thing is that most of the people couldn't really read the plans. So in order to facilitate understanding the plans, there were a series of questions. For example, which layout has the best location for the entrance? Which layout has the best circulation connecting old and new building? Which layout provides the best security? Which is the best for informal gathering spaces? So in order to answer the questions, they had to actually walk through the plan and learn how the plan worked. Again, this is kind of helping to increase the competence of uh, the participants. And so uh, this existing building and the proposed uh, music school. Again, uh, students presenting their ideas. Um, the agreement was just astounding because everybody liked the proposal. And um, there was a meeting that we had with the parents and teachers and reviewing the results of the last workshop. And uh, we built a model. Now, some of you that know me know that purple is one of my favorite colors. So when we presented the model to the students, <laughs> they said, uh, beautiful building, but wrong colors because purple and gold are the colors of the Minnesota Vikings football team. So we had to go back and <laughs> neutralize the colors and the building was subsequently built. Um, when I started uh, the PhD program about 20 years ago, um, it was called Community and Environmental Design. Now, the PhD program doesn't have studios, but it was important for the students to somehow get involved with community-based projects. So I had a number of projects going on, and so um, all the PhD students worked with me on the projects. This was a that that was an existing building. It's this is an addition to uh, an elementary school. Um, PhD students. Uh, oh, we we did something interesting. We had the architects who were actually going to do the addition work with the PhD students. Now the PhD students had degrees in architecture, but they didn't have very much practice, and of course they just most of them had just come to the United States since their first year. Um, so one of the important aspects of any project is kind of uh, a rediscovery. And we wanted the teachers to, to walk through their own classrooms and other classrooms and systematically do an evaluation. Look at the spatial layout and evaluate um, the personal space, shared space, look at physical attributes, daylighting, acoustics, temperature, look at the furniture movement, and they evaluated their own classroom. Now, this evaluation means that they had to carefully and consciously look at the place in which they teach. And this was important in order to move to the next step. Um, the workshop, included all the teachers. First workshop. Now, one of the interesting criticisms that I've heard for decades is that if you involve people, um, that limits the possibility of innovation because people could only accept what they've already experienced, what they've already seen. And um, I wanted to show that that's not true. Um, we, we looked at about 200 schools around the world and looked at different classroom arrangements for each one of these, the two classrooms, roughly 50 students. Um, we took out criteria from the educational literature and we had a workshop where we asked groups of teachers to review each of these alternatives according to educational criteria, working at small groups. Now the teachers had never looked at a floor plan before. 
So th these are the criteria. Students' ability to move, manipulate objects, varied seating arrangements, choose learning activities, um, team teaching. They all chose the L-shaped classroom. Now, um, some of my research in this area suggests that there's a link between student performance and motivation. If students are highly motivated, their performance is going to be uh, improved. Motivation is triggered by teacher-student relationship. So the more time a teacher spends with the students, that increases students' motivation. Now, in an L-shaped classroom, you cannot organize the seats in such a way that the teacher is in one position. The teacher, by definition, has to move around the classroom. And in the process of moving around the classroom, spends more time with students. So, uh, Daria, you may recognize one of your former students from North Cyprus. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, yes, Chelan. Yes, Chelan. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Well, she you can was, see this was yes. a few years yes. ago. Computers yeah. were a little different. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, and then, so once there was agreement that the L-shaped classroom was desirable, we had to organize a plan. There, there she is again. She keeps appearing. Right? Um, we had to develop a plan. There were, I think, six classroom mission. So here, there are two alternatives. The, the gray represents the existing building, and the um, yellow represents new addition. So the criteria was safety, visual appearance, transition spaces, relationship of classrooms to building addition, harmony, whatever. Everybody, all the teachers agreed, this was the best solution. So we did it. So it was it's just a model that was built. And that's what it looks like today. Now, the thing that's particularly interesting is that uh, you don't sense a corridor. Um, each one of the uh, classrooms has, has a breakout space. And the breakout space means that there's a wide variety of activities could be occurring. Um, so there was a little bit of a problem when this building was completed because all the teachers in the school wanted to move into these classrooms. There are only six classrooms. But that was the kind of an administrative um, issue that the school had to deal with. So it turned out that the kindergarten um, had the option. The daylight was fine. So this was really, uh, for us, it was important because the teachers had never experienced an L-shaped classroom. And um, when it was built, we did have to help a little bit in um, uh, moving furniture around. And as a result of this, we did a school um, which consists of L-shaped classrooms. Now, this is Russia, Moscow, and uh, two young people on either side are um, people I'm mentoring in Russia, are architects who are advocates of social change. Um, I was invited to a town called Volegda, um, which is, I think at one point, several hundred years ago, it was proposed to be the capital of Russia. And I think this was Ivan the Terrible's home. And I guess because he was so terrible, they decided to move to Moscow. At any rate, um, the mayor was very forceful, very important, very powerful. And he read my work. Uh, community participation methods. And I was invited to uh, uh, a series of seminars he called social planning, which was basically for government officials. You know, a lot of people in Russia work for the government. And these were the government officials who were somehow involved in planning. And the idea was to train them 
in, in different techniques for involving local people. Volunteerism was a big issue in, in Russia, but um, they, they didn't really know how to interpret it in such a way that it could have an impact in uh, space planning and, and community planning. So I'm doing, I did a number of workshops. Hello? Uh, something happened. We see the slides, the slides Harry. Harry. There's no problem There's here. There's no problem here. Um, no, it doesn't. It doesn't move. Uh, we can move. Uh, we can move. Next one. Thank. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> so they translated um, democratic design, but uh, it wasn't democratic design. I think it was called participatory design. And I was in Russia for a book signing, and it turned out that the um, the Ministry of Education, which is responsible for architecture as well, identified seven books for all the students in architecture in Russia to read. There are about 75 schools of architecture, and um, participatory design is one of the books that they recommended to read. Next, please. Uh, it says changed. Next. Or it's changed. Can you do the next one? Which one? This one? Okay, that's good. Okay, so this is Russia. Um, this is more recent, but they don't have rooms that are big enough for small groups. So their groups tend to be, you know, this one's okay, five, but um, Nadia, this young woman um, who I've been mentoring, won an award, it was an international award for leaders, young leaders, because of the work that she's doing in Russia in organizing communities to do these workshops. Uh, she's now in the process of doing a book called Design Games, but it's the, in Russian, not necessarily translating my work, but using the methods that she's developed uh, in Russian. So here they are. Um, and and the, the projects that she started have to do with the outside areas. And in Russia, there are lots of high rise buildings. And next, please. There are lots of high rise yes. apartment buildings. And typically, the land it? is left. Yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah, uh, the land is left vacant, and so what she's been organizing is um, the residents in these housing blocks um, to begin to work together to develop the kinds of activities that could occur outdoors. Now, in Russia, even though it's cold, you know, people spend a lot of time outdoors, and um, they've been able to get money from the government, and they're doing literally. She's spending more time organizing communities and less in architecture. Um, and this is happening in, in many areas throughout Russia. So the focus immediately is really on um, land adjacent to high rise housing blocks uh, that have been basically ignored. And uh, it's, it's been well publicized and well known around the world. Next, please. Next one. Yes, this is the last one. Okay, so um, a lot of the work that I've shown, plus more, is in um, a new book called Participatory Environmental Design. Um, the, the problem I found, every time I develop a concept, it gets co-opted. Um, IKEA now, on their front page, says democratic design. So I have to change it now, call it participatory environmental design. So uh, it's it's available through Amazon, uh, and it has some of the projects that I've shown you plus plus others. So let me, in conclusion, there's one simple concept, and the concept is uh, responsibility of designers and planners traditionally has been um, to the paying client, and I think it's important that we consider the non-paying client 
as equal. And in the process, if we believe that this is important, we have to re-examine the way in which we communicate because nobody understands the ways in which um, architects and landscape architects communicate. It's a highly technical language um, and it, it doesn't really, it doesn't work. So the new techniques need to be developed. So it means that new tools need to be added to the current toolbox that each of you have. Thank you very much. We thank you, Harry, uh, for this wonderful presentation. You have shown once again how important the design process is. Uh, on the contrary to an approach which jumps into the technical details in a very short time. So I'm very pleased to come to the end of this uh, this yeah. way. And now uh, we have a half an hour session for questions and answers. Sure. And sure. Uh, the audience, uh, if you if you like to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand just clicking on this uh, sign at the bottom with a man with a hand raising. And we will see. Uh, uh, you may ask questions in Turkish as well. Türkçe de sorabilirsiniz. Öğrencilerimiz özellikle e, eğer zorluk çekenler varsa e, veya diğer arkadaşlardan e, Türkçe yazabilirsiniz chat'e. E, ben tercüme ederim. Thank you. Waiting. Tuğçe Nur Kamiloğlu, uh, we will be pleased if you could introduce yourself first. Yes, Tuğçe. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Tuğçe. Mm -hmm. I'm a can fourth I, year can student. I get the picture? Can I get the picture of who's speaking? Uh, Tuğçe... If uh, Tuğçe kendini gösterebilir misin? Kameranı açar mısın? Uh, şu an açmasam olur mu hocam? Şu an tek başıma değilim. Tamam. Bulundum nerede? Okay. Uh, she, uh, she doesn't prefer to open because <gülüyor> not convenient. <gülüyor> not convenient at the moment. <gülüyor> okay. Yeah. Was that a question? Uh, yes. Uh, firstly, thank you for coming to our university. Presentation was informative and enjoyable to attend. And uh, my question will be that, uh, as we know lately, there was a contest organized by Istanbul Municipality to design the Taksim Square. And about 30% of the contest result decided by the votes of the citizens. Some architects from the Chamber of Architects and many well-known uh, architects criticized that this is a matter for professionals to determine and the public choice is the wrong decision. I'm not sh sure how accurate it is to design a new square project and changing the function of a space like this, but uh, probably this uh, could be another topic of discussion. But my question is, how should be the participation of everyone in such projects in terms of participatory architecture and isn't architecture a matter for professionals to decide? Thank you. Um, I, um, I'm Basically, the question is, <clears throat> should or could a lot of people be involved in the process? Um, I've done workshops yes. with 400 people. I think the, the, I, the concept has got to be the same, that everybody should have an opportunity to speak, which means small groups. Um, so the, the size of the of the community doesn't really make any difference. There are ways of, um, you don't have to do it all at the same time. You can do it at different incremental times. But I think the, the most important thing is that sense of ownership, that people who participate have to feel that they own something. The other thing that's equally important, in many instances, um, 
people have never been asked. And so sometimes it's clear that not everybody gets their own way, but they feel okay because at least they've been listened to. Um, but the problem of size is, is not a critical issue. Um, and I, I'm not sure if, if there was something else that you're asking about that as well. Harry? Oh, okay. I don't know if I answered the question. Is that all right, Tuche? Uh, yes, thank you. And okay. uh, thank you. Isn't, it voting, uh, uh, is, isn't it voting is a uh, great? I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't understand. Sorry, I Once couldn't more. get uh, Is voting uh, isn't okay? I couldn't understand voting, that part. Voting is not okay. Yes. Oh, no. Okay, thank you. Well, you know, what, the problem of voting, there are winners and losers. Now, losers are not very happy. So there has to be a situation where people feel that they may not, uh, they may not necessarily have their, their proposal accepted but at least people listen to them so they don't feel that they've been ignored. Um, voting has negative consequences. Um, we see that at the highest level, the national level in every country. The people who lose, well, in the United, the United States is going crazy now by people who lost. They become vicious. Um, and, and so at, at the national level, it's difficult. At the local level, there has to be a way of solving problems without voting. Okay, thank you, Duce. And uh, next, uh, we have a question from Dennis Sasserja, uh, the former PhD thank student. You. Actually, Henry has many uh, former students in Turkey, and Dennis, uh, Orchon, and Özlem are uh, some of those. Yes. Please. Okay, hello, thank you. I was trying to open my camera. Uh, I think I, I wasn't successful in doing this. Uh, anyway, I'll just go right ahead. Uh, the system doesn't allow me to open my camera right now. Anyway, okay. uh, Henry, uh, I'd just like to th say thank you for this wonderful presentation. I know some of these projects very well and uh, some that I didn't know about, so it was wonderful. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank you for that, but I'd also like to thank you for, um, I mean, I'm just so grateful for having met you uh, 20 years ago and your books even before that, uh, because now I teach uh, <clears throat> environment behavior, uh, I have PhD students, some of them are here, my master's students who are working in participatory design. I've done projects like this, and it's, you know, this network, I know people like Orchun, this network all, um, you know, came from you. So I'm very happy uh, for that, that. I'd like to thank you for that. I feel very lucky. Um, oh, my question, oh, um, yes. <laughs> I have a question. <laughs> my question is, um, and it relates to uh, Gökhan Kiskin is here. He's uh, a PhD student of mine, and Melis Ernekolu uh, also worked on participation with me uh, during her master's. But uh, it relates to Gökhan's um, thesis, dissertation, a little bit. What are some of the changes you foresee with regards to participatory design today, especially now? Oh, How can people well. participate uh, in different in different ways? Oh, I'm here. Okay, you can see me. That's yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, um, good. How can people participate in different ways? Well, let's uh, say in one the thing. Era. Digitally, uh, virtually, on projects, oh, using resources um, at any time. Well, um, you know, when I was teaching a studio, there were never more than two or three students working on a project. Mm -hmm. That solves that problem. Working in a community, um, it's very difficult now to get people to come together, you know, and it's going to be a while before, even after everybody's vaccinated, it's still not going to happen that quickly. Yes, um, yes. And it, so it's hard to, 
develop generic solutions because communities are different. There are many communities um, that don't have access to computers, don't have the technology, uh, so different strategies have to be used. Um, mm -hmm. Some work that's been going on in Mexico is in rural areas, but people aren't close together, they can spread out and it's less of a problem. So you can have large groups, but they're physically dispersed. Um, urban areas, it's, it's hard to generalize on that. Um, um, because every, every community is totally different in how they want to deal with this issue. Um, part of it may be that people just reject the idea of participation. Um, participatory design has a lot of baggage. I started using it about 40 years ago and it became a, a political issue. And over mm -hmm. time it changed community design. Now it's referred to as public interest design. That means that anything is possible and it's not politically charged. So um, the, the action component is gone. So right. yeah, right. Um, participation is done through surveys and you know, other mechanisms. But um, so I really don't have a, a clear answer for how you work with large groups, uh, other than depends on the situation where people are willing to come together, space themselves apart, uh, and and do the same kinds of exercises. Right, and there are new ways of. Um, huh? collaborating perhaps online uh, through new methods, maybe new platforms? Well, I'm not sure how many new methods there are, but there's a uh -huh. new book that just came out, a book that just came out uh, called um, Games, let's see. Games in Architecture and Urban Planning. It's um, <laughs> games you uh, papers by people around the world. I just got a, um, a dissertation from Latvia on the use of games. Mm. So I think the concept has taken 50 more, more years to, to kind of get embedded in the culture. Um, but um, it's really difficult since rural areas are dramatically different than urban areas. The problems are different, the people are different, uh, it's, and it's, it's really impossible to generalize. Um, mm -hmm. But it's not, not impossible to deal with. The right. idea, if you really think it's important, you can figure out a way of doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, sure. my my very best to Joan, and, uh, Zoe, thank Larry, um, Daria, Hojam. Thank you for organizing this wonderful event and having it uh, open access. Thank you. You are very welcome. Good to see you all here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I will continue from here, just reading a text uh, from Chidan Polatolu from Yildiz Technical University. She says. Dear Professor, thank you so much for the conference. After 30 years, it's so nice to hear you again. Your books are inspiring to our students too. And we have more questions from uh, Gökhan Keskin and uh, Beza Chille. Yes, please. Gökhan. Hi. Uh, Hi. Uh, yeah, can you see me now? I activate my, my camera, but I'm connected with my uh, cell phone. I hope you can see me and hear we me. We can clearly. see you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the professors. It was really a uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, I am working with Deniz Asırcı. And you are kind of a guide for me. Uh, I am reading all your researches uh, and listening to you is really perfect uh, to hear you, your real experiences. And I'm so happy to hear that's all the process. I have just one simple question because I'm really focused on that uh, topic now, uh, the social media effects on the participatory design process. 
uh, what do you think uh, how it can change the approach to, or it can be a new method like uh, Deniz Acısasır hocamız asked like if it could be a new method do you think uh, we can find out with the social media effects in the part of the design thank you thank you by the way was that a question I didn't yeah Did the question is uh, Yes, the question, how the social media can affect the parts better design process, do you think? Or could it be used well, as a tool, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Well, um, when we talk about social media, you're talking about one aspect of the population. Um, the problem is, what about the people that don't have access to social media, don't have access to computers. And it, it seems to me that that's um, a population that's systematically been ignored. So um, I think with, with social media, there's so many different ways in which you can engage people. But the, you, know, you go into rural areas around the world, people don't have the, the technology but they still have the concerns and the problems. And it seems to me that um, uh, overemphasis on social media tends to ignore uh, uh, a majority of the population in the world because that's where the problems exist. So um, I don't feel that um, the discussions about social media are critical because if you have the technology, then you can figure out the strategies. The issue is what about those people that don't have the technology? They don't have social media. And I think that's the population that's been systematically ignored. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, and we have Beza, I think. Ready, is Beza? Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, but hear. we cannot see you. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to uh, share my video, but uh, it says I can't share it. Okay. Uh, maybe I will be able to like uh, the other ask her the uh, other one who asked question. I will hope to do that. Uh, hello, Professor Senov. I would like to ask you a question, but uh, before that, I would like to thank you for this presentation and thank uh, Daria Oktay for this presentation as well. Uh, what my question is about is that uh, I saw you mentioned some symbols. Um, it wasn't the first time I saw uh, your symbols. By the way, ex excuse my English. <laughs> I am uh, a research assistant and a master's student. So I'm uh, kind of new to this uh, academic environment. And uh, I couldn't have some chances to speak with uh, people in English. So uh, excuse me for that. Uh, my question was about uh, your symbols, uh, your design process, uh, because for my thesis, uh, by the way, my advisor is here. Uh, she is listening uh, as well, Mehtap Özbayraktar, uh, so she will hear this too. Uh, my advisor and me uh, noticed that you produced, designed uh, those, those symbols for the practices uh, that were being being done, done in that environment. And I will be needing to uh, design some uh, some kind of symbols as well for my thesis. Um, yes. I'm, I'm interested in that topic. So uh, what kind of uh, design process did you have uh, while designing, producing those, sim those symbols? Uh, did you um, watch the people's practices while, while uh, designing those symbols? Or um, have you ever, I'm, I'm sure you have, but uh, while you were watching those people's practices, uh, did you come up with those symbols in uh, while um, writing or drawing or uh, how? What kind of process did you have while designing those? Uh, I I will make it simple. 
Okay. That's my question. Um, Thank you uh, in advance. Well, the, the first step was to look at um, symbols that are commonly used around the world. Um, the restaurants use symbols, um, their traffic symbols. Um, there weren't ma many, but um, that's the, and there's, a, there's a book called Symbol Sourcebook. Um, but it turned out that we had to develop our own symbols. Um, in Japan, uh, I had maybe 10 or 15 people designing symbols, and all they had was an activity. And they had to develop a symbol that corresponds to that, that activity so that people could understand it. Uh, so that it's not a very sophisticated process. Uh, as a matter of fact, with, with each symbol, there's the, the title of the symbol. So after you're yes. using them a while, you get to know uh, what they mean. Um, but um, to a great extent, we have designed symbols for virtually every different kinds of activity, for, for schools, for senior centers, for art centers. Um, and, and so it's, we can test them very easily by generating a symbol and asking people what the symbol represents. Um, but it's not a very sophisticated process for uh, designing symbols. I uh, see. Similar to the symbol that's appearing on the screen now. You know, it's, it's, it's a very abstract symbol of a person. Right? Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. It's, uh, it's, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Reza, do you continue? Uh, can I continue? <laughs> Oh, okay, please, yeah. Something small. Um, while designing the uh, symbols, I was uh, approaching this so simple, like uh, a square for standing people or a, a circle for sitting people. And uh, my advisor uh, recommended you to me uh, to uh, research how you made those symbols. Uh, so I need to approach this uh, abstractly, as you said, uh, but I, I uh, need to watch those people i think uh, that's what you did uh, with those people uh, those people who uh, helped you so i will try to approach this uh, in an abstract way and in a complex way uh, so i i hope i will be able to uh, design those symbols because uh, i think we need to have our own symbols and not have uh, or take some other uh, designers and i will try to do that thank you Okay, that's a good idea. You know, I've developed um, a set of standard symbols for uh, community art centers, for senior centers, um, and maybe a few other projects. And, and it's been published and they've been used. Um, but th th there, there is symbol source book is a good uh, beginning. It's a good, it's a good reference. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Beza. Uh, which university do you come from, Beza? Uh, it's Kojil University. Kojil, okay, thank you. Yes. Thank uh, you. We have a, a question from Tuche Uchar Maurer. Uh, actually, she's one of uh, my two great assistants here <laughs> at Kojil University. Hi. She's a PhD student at uh, Istanbul Technical University. Yes. Hey everyone, uh, first of all, I really appreciated uh, Hanshanov. It was very enlightening uh, presentation in so many levels. So you've been honored us, thank you so much. And I also want to say a great thanks to Daria Oktay. She's perfect as always. And uh, thank you for us to reaching uh, Dr. Henry. <laughs> I'm an actually urban planner. That's why um, participatory design is actually one of the big uh, topic and very contradictory issue in my own subject too. Why I was uh, listening your presentation, uh, I asked myself a question like, yeah, it might be possible to um, make a participatory design in architectural level, uh, uh, building level. But when we think about like big urban um, design project, uh, what the other Turkey actually mentioned. For example, Istanbul is a metropolitan area. There is lots of urban design um, uh, projects uh, trying to be prepared. 
uh, from that point, um, like how we can take everyone's opinion and how we gonna make everyone happy? Because it's, I, I think it's really hard when we, you know, take from that aspect. That's why I want to uh, ask you, like, what's your opinion? How we can create inclusive uh, plans sure. that? <laughs> Thank you so okay. much again. Well, sure. Um, first, let me give you my bias, because I don't believe in the concept of urban design. Um, urban design is flying over uh, a, a location about a thousand, two thousand feet. Nobody I know lives at the urban level. Most people live at the local level, what happens down at the street. So if you're concerned with some kind of human involvement, um, basically people who live in neighborhoods and communities are experts in their communities. They're not experts in the city. They're experts in the place that they live. So um, basically, it's it's the concept of general systems theory. Take a big situation and break it down into very small parts. Um, there was um, a project some years ago in England where they were proposing a highway. And, you know, engineers propose a highway to an existing community, like a straight line, cut right through. And I was a psychologist who was involved. And what he did is identify um, different neighborhoods where the highway would go through. And each neighborhood would decide which streets could be used for the highway. Then there were people who would make the connection from one neighborhood to the next. Very intelligent solution. Uh, it may have taken a lot longer than just you know, bulldozing a highway. But if you look at um, a large situation, break it down into small situations where if you want people to be involved, they need to have the expertise in the area. As the projects get larger, you lose local people because the projects to be more complicated, they, they require more technical knowledge. So if you're really looking at participation, it has to be done at a local level where, where you know, people are expert at where they live and the street that they live. They're not expert in their city because there are too many other factors that are affecting it. So in, in that way, take a big project, break it down to small pieces. You can solve the problem. It's easier. That makes sense? Uh, Harry, uh, Harry, uh, Harry uh, is it fine for you? Or I, I will or just I intervene will just to say something. Say something. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, Harry, I think you meant city playing by saying that uh, things are visible, not visible from 2,000 miles uh, and doesn't deal with uh, uh, spaces in detail. I think you defined, uh, re you refer to city planning. Urban design is uh, just the scale you mentioned, you actually uh, referenced. We, you know, it's a bridge between architecture and city planning and deals with the human life and urban life in between buildings uh, at the space scale and always people are the center. Uh, I think city planning, what you meant. Well, I, I think it's difficult for, first of all, people can understand the maps and the drawings that landscape architects and planners do. They do not understand it. Um, issues that occur at an urban level are a lot more complicated than the issues that people face in their own neighborhood. So if you want to involve people, their expertise is limited to where they live. Of course. So um, there are many different levels in which you can involve people. But the people, as the issue is larger and more technically complex, the people that get involved have to have a very different kind of expertise. So that means that you, get, you lose local people. Um, so I think the, the issue of scale is one of technical complexity. As you increase the scale, the, the 
issues become more complex. The people that need to make decisions, get involved, have to have a different level of experience. So for me, I'm working in small communities. So for me, you know, the local people are extremely important. And so I, mean, I tend to agree, regard that it's local not people are excellent. We like you. <laughs> As an architect and urban design, uh, yes, your yes, work yes. are always appreciated by me, you know, because we human being is the center in urban design too. <laughs> Yes, and very, yes, it's a great support to urban design, what you have done. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> Etuche, would you like to say anything else? Thank you so much. And I really appreciate your opinion about like seeing a place that like a uh, designing process is a game and there's like rules that we need to follow. And I think that was really um, important perception for me. And like there's always like problems that we're trying to solve but you were so right we ignoring the like positive sides and elegance uh values of the places it is good that you remind us that we should also like consider them before we like jump into the problem and start drawing that's why i'm really appreciate for everything that you share thank you so much thank you thank you thank you to uh, do we have any more questions or no? I think maybe I can add. Okay, Orchun, Orchun Capes, please go ahead. Uh, anyway, thank you very much for this wonderful Hello. lecture. Hi, it's been <laughs> uh, so nice to see you. And here you get, uh, hear this lecture. Like uh, the old days. Like the old days, <laughs> I mean, like the old days. Uh, we miss you so much. And hopefully after this pandemic, uh, we'll come to visit. Um, yeah, we don't, don't to... yeah, we don't count this. We don't count on this. <laughs> no, no, we'll see. No. Um, I just don't want to, you know, get in the uh, way of uh, other participants of the conference. Uh, just something uh, we've been facing in Turkey, especially when applying participatory design techniques. Whenever, uh, I, I mean, as a society, uh, Turkey is very high in authority distance in the index. So, you know, the people, <laughs> who uh, make decisions, um, they don't like to give up the control. Sure. Uh, even, when, even, you know, when they sign contracts, uh, when they sign contracts and when they promise that they won't uh, get in the way uh, of community, uh, it's so hard to isolate uh, them in a small group. Although sometimes when they don't participate, um, they want to alter the findings of workshops. Sure. So uh, I think there is a cultural uh, issue. Uh, how would you, I remember when you come here, uh, we just walk into this, uh, you know, school, that's right, uh, by Kadras University, and we did this wonderful workshop with students. Uh, but it's getting harder and harder, uh, especially with this uh, with this approach, with authorities not giving up control uh, to the community. So, what would be your recommendation? Uh, well, that happens in the United States too. That happens in the United States. Um, developers have more power than politically elected people in the United States. Um, if you really want to have an impact then you have to run for political office. You can't say hi. You can't say hi. You can't say hi. You can't say hi. Hi. You can't. Hi. You can't say, hi. say hi. Sweet. How sweet you are. She was so um, little when in the West here. You have to be in a position of power. You know, it's like easier to push down than to push up. You have to run for political office. This, I mean, um, the, the, what you're saying 
happens every day in every city. I mean, it's happening in Raleigh, something we developed 40 years ago. The uh, mayor came along and just trashed it all. Uh, so now, you know, we're looking to vote for a different mayor who may be more accepting. Um, look for where the power is. The power is become a developer, become a politically elected official. Now, you know, for a long time in the United States, academics were saying, you know, architects shouldn't be involved in politics. That's very naive because we've <laughs> seen already in cities, not only in the United States, but elsewhere in the world, that um, if, if you're a mayor and you're an architect, you can set the agenda for what's important. Um, so it's difficult. The situation you describe is really a difficult one because it happens all the time. Um, I can deal with it sometimes by arguing that all the people who have an impact on the decision have to be involved in the, in the process entirely. And mm -hmm. we develop strategy for looking at who the issue leaders are, so we make sure that everybody is, is going to be involved. Because there are always absentee people who have a lot of power, and nobody even knows who they are, and they stop things from happening. So in, in political science, there are strategies called identifying issue leaders. So sometimes it's not always politically elected people but they're invisible people that have control. So there are ways of identifying it. And once you identify it, to make sure that those people get involved. Um, thank you. And thank you, uh, Daria Arjan, for uh, bringing Henry to us, to uh, <laughs> the design community, and making My this pleasure. a public lecture and announcing it widely. Uh, Henry, thank you. Uh, again, you, you. provide yes. wisdom. Thank you for uh, and participating. And to John, yeah. Ari, Zoe, and Chloe. They're good. Bye -bye. They're good. Thanks. Uh, we have one last question from Chi Sam Yamur Yuxal. I'm just reading it. Hello, dear professor. My question is: Children's participation in design is also important. Does integrating child participation in architectural education improve the moral reasoning method of those involved? That was a statement. Uh, children's participation in design or in architectural education? Which one you are asking for? Chisa. I think it's in design. Would you like to say something, Harry? I'm sorry, I, I didn't, I, I'm not sure yeah. I understand. What mm. Are you here, Chisam? Yikta, can we, can we change her status? Chisam can moderate? speak. I gave her permission. To speak. Chisam, please speak yourself. Please make your microphone on at the bottom of the screen in the middle. I think she has a problem. Okay, let me ask one question, a, a more general question actually. Uh, to what extent should we accommodate uh, research in design and in design education? Uh, as you know, in reporting on architecture and design, it's found that notable results, advancements, often uh, result from systematic inquiry. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we also rea realize that design is also an intuitive. Uh, a process, intuitive work, and not a totally methodical process. So, in this case, uh, where does applied research like yours, a formal investigation to find a solution uh, to a specific practical problem, where does it fit in in this context? To what extent? I, 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 I think I missed the essence of the question. 
the essence is that um, the research, uh, to what extent should uh, should uh, we accommodate research in in oh, the design oh, oh, process? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I see. okay. Because well, the design okay. is also intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Um, I don't use the word research at all. Um, programming, I think, is critical. I, you may call it a brief. Um, and, and that's really where you gather information about what you're trying to do. So how you get that information is called research. It's not intuitive. You know, if you, whether it's schools or housing, whatever, you need to develop a program. And the program is basically evidence. So you need to have evidence for the decisions that you're making. Now, now in the United States, it's referred to evidence-based design, which is basically programming. It's basically doing research okay. to get evidence. So sometimes you've got to change the language um, because sometimes when you talk about research, uh, designers get very nervous. Um, they're not researchers. That kind of um, suppresses their uh, intuition. Yeah. Actually, there is uh, another term, scholarship. Research and scholarship, they are not the same thing, as you know. Not the same. Uh, the same. Yeah, yeah. Research but, no, for, is about non-existing. Yeah. Yeah, for academics um, and, and professional organizations, you can talk about research. Um, but Working with students, it's very difficult. It's difficult because um, you really need to talk about evidence. How do you know? Um, and this has become an issue uh, in many countries. People are asking, you know, intuition is not sufficient. You know, when you're dealing with tough problems, and that's why it happened with, uh, with hospitals, evidence-based design started with hospitals because it's a risk. Um, those decisions are crucial. And in many cases, housing is a classic example of um, certainly mass housing, a classic example of errors that are made because of no evidence, because of um, bad information. So there are, there are lots of situations where there's no, no information, no evidence, just flipping the coin or shooting from the hip or purely intuition. But one thing that's I found um, really crucial, and that's the idea of trust. Um, to a great extent, the profession, architectural profession is not trusted by the community because it felt that all the decisions are intuitive decisions. Mm -hmm. and, yes, and yes. In all, the work, in all the work that I do, it's important when you open up the process, when everybody's involved, mm -hmm. the, the process becomes transparent and there's a sense of trust between you and the community. Then when you make a suggestion, they trust you. If you know, that, the, the point in, in, um, in the, the riverfront recreation area in Japan, for two years, Planners from government, architects from government, were making suggestions and were rejected. And I came along in three days. Community was involved, a sense of trust, and everything changed. So I, once you open up the process, it changes the relationship between the architect and the community. So yes, then, they are. Uh -huh. Then it, you know you don't even need to use the words intuition. You know if you feel something and the people trust you. Accept. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, actually, I said uh, it's a general question. Uh, it wasn't directly related to your uh, studies, your work. Uh, I know how valuable uh, what you have done, design. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's understood. Thank you so much, the, uh, Henry. I think you are tired. Uh, we, are, we have already extended hours. Uh, I think there are no more questions. and. We can only thank Henry once again on behalf of you. Uh, hope to see you again. Uh, in, would, in, be, any... would, would this be available on YouTube? 
the lecture. I will ask. This, this is being recorded, but for the school schools use. But it's. I think it's possible if we, if you prefer, if you prefer. So I don't so know. Other people, so other people could have access to it. Uh, I will ask. I will ask. Oh. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate if, that. If there's a permission, yes, we could. <laughs> okay. uh, sure thank sure. you so much and uh, greetings to all. And, nice uh, to see you, see you and to Joan. Uh, hope to yes. see you again you. in the near future. Yes. Right. And there are thank many you. thanks on the other side. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, awesome. To the audience, thank Hello. you so much yes. for your participation uh, and for your questions. Did I think it was? Uh, enjoyable and uh, fruitful. Uh, hope to meet you somewhere else in, in person. Good hopefully, night hopefully. and have a good day. Good day to right. to you. Bye bye. Right. Bye bye. You can close.